now entering the horror sector. Hello and welcome back to the Horror Sanctum Podcast. I'm Jay with John, Kellen, and TJ. Uh, and this week we're going to be chatting with, and I just I just stopped chatting. That's just the appropriate <laughs> word for this guest. Uh, we'll be chatting with, uh, an honor to be joined by actor, writer, director, uh, Mr. Nicholas Vince. Mr. Vince, welcome to the Sanctum. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Jay. Yeah, I like that. It's it, yes, yeah. I have been, <laughs> we'll so be I, chattering with chattering. Yeah, yeah. I've done chattering with Nicholas Vince. I've done the chattering hour. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I take as much advantage of this as possible. Right. Um, so you've been in several films, including Book of Monsters, which we all love. We actually had Lindsay on the show. She's one of our first guests. She's amazing. Um, you've also been in Nightbreed. Another oh. amazing film, uh, but you were probably most well known for your role in the Hellraiser series as the Cenobite Chatterer. Um, so naturally, that's where we're going to start. Um, okay. I was curious, how did you come about uh, landing this role? And off of that, tell us about that process of getting those prosthetics and the makeup and, and, and all that. Okay, cool. All right. So I was a friend of Clive's. Uh, is the short answer to that question. In fact, Clive, all the Cenobites um, were friends of his. Doug Bradley, he'd known since school. Simon and Simon Bamford, who plays Butterball, and I were at drama school together, uh, Mount View Theatre School, uh, which was near where Clive lived. And Clive had seen Simon literally playing the fool in King Lear, um, and invited him to join his uh, theatre company, the Dog Company, which Simon did when he graduated. And then about a year or so later, uh, I think Simon must have invited me to a party, and I just met Clive. And this is about three years before Hellraiser. Uh, and so uh, we just, yeah, and Clive had two, uh, he, his cousin, Grace, played the um, female Cenobite. And Clive's uh, condition was that he didn't want just extras playing the Cenobites. He wanted actors. He really wanted actors. I was just very fortunate he decided to choose me and, uh, and, and his other mates, basically, um, to play Cenobites. So that's how it came about. That's how I got the part. Uh, the makeup, process i got a smart aleck answer to that and my smart aleck answer is it took about three months because if you factor in before you get anywhere close to actually putting the makeup on the actor it, ourselves you've got all the preparation stuff so in those days um do a thing called a life cast where they cover your face in alginate uh, which is a the powder that they use in dentists when they're taking impressions of your teeth. Um, they cover your face in that. Um, and then they, they, that's so they can get the detail. And then they cover you in plaster of Paris bandages um, to uh, form a mold. They then fill that mold with um, so two parts, shove it back together again, fill it with plaster uh take that off and then they physically sculpt in clay or they did in those days they use clay uh the um the actual mask itself then they repeat that process for the mask scrape off all the clay god this is boring anyone doesn't want to know how to do this but this is how you made one, uh, masks in those days um and then they fill up the gap with uh, latex rubber now that took a long time that took three months uh to do that kind of stuff um i think it was about three months it may have been two to it may have been closer to two months but it certainly took a, a while i was very lucky on the day they it actually only took about an hour into makeup and costume because uh it wasn't stuck to my face it wasn't pieces it was just the single mask with the teeth which are attached to my teeth as well um, so yeah, smart aleck answer is it took about two to three months uh, on the day, about an hour into makeup and costume. And we were debating before you jumped on, 
the first rendition of the mask, the eyes were so shut. Mm. It's, how did you see out of that mask? I didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a little teeny tiny pinhole for me to to see. So basically, um, I had very very limited hearing, speech, and uh, and uh, I was led around the set by the hand. Um, that you know because I couldn't see once I was in it. Um, it was it was tough. It was very tough to to act. And that Simon was was, I think. He was completely blind when he was in Butterball, and he had the same thing. So we, we, you know, they they kept, but because for the both of us, um, it was very quick to get the makeup on. They left it at us out of it as much as possible, uh, and then just put it on when we were needed to go on set. Except in my case, for a couple of days, um, when they put me, they left me in it for about eight hours. Um, so like, yeah, we're just gonna get we're gonna get to him and then come to the end of the day and they said, like, oh, actually, we're not gonna do it today. Um, right. Two days in a row. That was not pleasant. <laughs> I, I imagine having to trust somebody to uh, that's that's a lot of trust involved. Like I can't see, take me where I need to be. Mm -hmm. I guess they would have to constantly be positioning you and everything. Yeah, that, that's yeah, easy. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I could see a bit. I kind of it was like it is literally you know like that. Um, so if you look at it, when you see me, you, I've got a slight tilt uh, looking to the side. It's so that I can kind of look forward through the left eye slightly. You'll see him, the final scene when he's pushing, when I was pushing Andrew backwards, I, I notice it when I look at the film, it's like, yeah, there's a reason why I'm looking slightly off and as if I'm looking, kind of being very, which funnily enough, I think sells how dismissive he is of Andrew Robinson playing Frank, um, trying to leave at the very end of the film. Sorry, spoilers. Um, but he pushes him back because he's just got this, who you're kidding, look about it. And it's just because I wanted to make sure I could actually see <laughs> or as close to see as possible before. <laughs> Didn't actually knock over one of the lead actors and injure them. I think, yeah. That's funny. So before, I'm, I'm sure you get a ton of Hellraiser questions. I would assume it's 90% of what you answer. So I'm going to ask some different things. But I, before we move on to something else, did you enjoy the new rendition of the film, the one that Hulu put out? Have you yes, seen I, that did. One? I did. I did. I I know people, you know, I have a number of people saying, yeah, it wasn't the same. Well, duh. Right. Um, <laughs> No, it's not going to be the same. It's really hard to take something that is so well established and, and is so complete in itself and stood the test of time and do something different with it. I think my reaction is a lot based on the fact that I went on to write Hellraiser comics. So we, I wrote eight-page comic stories that were put into anthologies and it's very hard to do a short story, which is not somebody opens, a, you know, finds a puzzle box, gets the puzzle box, opens the puzzle box, the Cenobites come. It's very hard to do something different with that. Um, I think we, we did, there are some wonderful stories in the, in the Hellraiser, um, the original Hellraiser comics and the more recent versions. Uh, but it's hard to get away from that, you know, to actually, and I, uh, tremendous respect. I like the fact that you had the lament configuration was only one form of the puzzle box. Um, I thought that was a good gag. I happened to know that they'd recast, you know, that I was not going to be, I was never going to be able to place Chatterer again, uh, put on way too much weight. Um, I knew that the actor who was playing it was very tall, um, and I thought that's great. That that's really very very cool. And of course, it's the difference between foam, latex, rubber, and um, silicon uh, as a as a makeup medium. I think they were able to go a lot more extreme in terms of the um, what they're representing. And I like the fact that it's a female pinhead. Uh, I thought Jamie did a great job in that. And I just thought, yeah, no, you know, well done, everyone involved. And no, it'll never be 
like Hellraiser <laughs> because you can't make it, you know, twice. I think the you know the closest we got with it was Hellbound because they're so beautifully meshed together. The, the you know the Hellraiser two. Um, so yeah, I did enjoy Hulu. I'm a big yeah, fan. I of thought that. it was probably one of the better remakes we've gotten. Mm. And and oh, like you it. said, you can't you can't catch lightning in a bottle twice. So all these other movies they get you know shit on so much but that's because mm. in our heads we have what pinhead looks like and it's doug you know yeah. we have what freddy krueger looks like what leatherface looks like and then that's what we stick to so when these other movies come out and try to do something different we're just like no i'm good it's terrible yeah yeah like even the exorcist believer we just did an episode on that and i think everybody hated it but me for the most part i'm like you know i, I get what they were trying to do but you're not you're never going to be able to recreate the original exorcist never uh, ever ever we just have to realize and evolve and change the way we think about things and, and also the, i was oh gosh i was watching something uh the last couple of days and somebody was pointing out the, the fact that horror is based on the society that creates it the monsters that we react to are based on what's going on at the at the time um the the classic one, you know, King Kong, this rampaging beast that goes through the um, jungle has been likened to the Great Depression and the way that it ripped up cities and destroyed things, you know, it's an unstoppable force that seemed to be devastating stuff. Um, invasion of the body snatchers and the whole communist thing and, and so on. You can, you know, you look at that. Therefore, when you're going back to something, there is an element of where we were at the time back in 1987 when that was originally released um so no, i think it's very hard yeah true um so i watched uh borley rectory mm. uh which is an animation hybrid film about the most haunted house in england you played reverend smith uh, from uh -huh. that i was just curious do you believe in ghosts um i always say i believe that people believe in ghosts and I think that's the important thing. Do I like the idea of a soul being trapped? No, I think that's terrible punishment for anybody. Um, I think there are lots of psychological reasons why people need to believe in ghosts. I think it's a lot to do with grieving and the process of grieving and, and so on and the the way that we react. You know, when somebody is suddenly taken from you, um, particularly under violent circumstances, I think it's part of the human condition. That's the way we do that. I love a good ghost story, though. I love, you know, I love a good, terrifying, weirdy. I grew up on ghost stories, um, reading anthologies of ghost, ghost stories from way too young, probably. Um, but personally, no, no, I'm not. I'm not convinced just because I don't like the concept. The other, I do believe in reincarnation. Funnily enough, I, uh, that's something that makes sense to me. Um, I like that for two particular reasons. I'm incredibly arrogant. The, the idea that I'm just going to be around and then you're dead. Poof. That's it. No, that doesn't suit me at all <laughs> in terms of my philosophy. But I also think if you believe in reincarn reincarnation, if you believe you might be reincarnated in this planet, you're going to take a lot more care of this planet. If you think, oh, it's not just your grandkids that are going to have to deal with the fact that the climate, there is such a thing as climate change, you might actually start thinking a little bit more about society and, and so on. And I think it's a more, to me, it's a more pleasing philosophical and life-enhancing philosophy um, in, in terms of reincarnation. That's I've never I've never heard anybody really explain it like you don't like the concept of ghosts because being trapped like that. Like I've never thought about it that way, and that makes a lot of sense. I personally don't uh, believe my wife swears she had one in a house she lived in. Um, I think his name was Hugh, but everybody's okay. different. I think Kellen's had some experiences. I've never personally had like a real experience. Like I've had some things that I can explain, but now that I look at it from what you just said, like, I don't want it. I don't want there to be ghosts. Cause no, that is kind of no. sad. Like what if, if I'm a ghost and I'm something happened to me in my life and I'm having to suffer through it through the afterlife. Like that, 
Yeah, that's not fun. <laughs> the, the, the other idea, I mean, the other concept, the other explanation of ghosts I've come across, which was explained in a uh, TV drama back in the 1970s called The Stone Tape. And that's the idea that when something really powerfully emotional or violent happens within a room, it's kind of written into the fabric of the brick or the stone or the wood. Um, it becomes and, like a resonant uh, yeah, it energy like a re memory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like a, um, they call that like a revenant. Echo. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so you know there are people who are sensitive to these things, and also if you're in a particularly heightened emotional state, you're kind of replaying the tape. So that kind of makes sense to me and takes out that thing of what I was talking about. It's not a soul trapped um, in in something. Uh, it is. Um, having said that, as a writer, I love playing with the idea of ghosts because I think they're really scary. They're fun to write about. Um, I, I got one more, and then we'll pass it along. Um, do you gravitate towards horror when you go up for roles, or when you're looking for something? Mm. Is that is that the genre that you prefer, or is it just it's it is what it is it's i i as i said i was reading ghost stories when i was probably way too young i'd been fascinated by horror way before i met clive i think that's one of the reasons clive and i got on so well when i first met him was because my love of horror and preachers goes back to making models of frankenstein and um phantom of the opera and the werewolf um, glow in the dark um, aurora models um mid-teens but reading um the greek myths and legends it just you know just reading lots and lots of ghost stories when i was a kid um so yeah and i've always been fascinated and in terms of i kind of like those things because i think it's actually such an important medium horror because i think when it's done well when it's done intelligently it can it deals with the big questions of life sex and death um and that's what i you know and it can when it's done intelligently i think it's it it really shows something about the human condition thinking of things like mask of the red roger corman's mask of the red death um so things that just make you think and the mist is one of my favorites because it's not so much about the mist the real horror comes from the people inside it comes from that wonderful i can't remember the lady's name who plays it who just turn you know says this is the end of days this is the re this, you're all being punished and of course everyone flocks to her because she's got an answer she can explain it and even better can point to people to blame um, for what's going outside the doors and the things in the mist. So I think it, yeah, I've always gravitated. Somebody was asking, the producer, funnily enough, was asking this, this the other day. I mean, I've no objection to playing something outside horror, but yeah, I, I'm quite happy working in horror. Marsha Gay oh. Harden is, is the lady. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Great actress. Absolutely terrifying in that film. So I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to the chatterer one more time because I have a very specific question about that character. Um, mm. As an actor, what are some of the hurdles of trying to quote unquote act when you're so hindered by prosthetics and the entire outfit? It, it, it's a very good question because um, somebody once said to me, um, somebody at the convention I was chatting said, it, "How impressed by what a measured performance I've given." And I thought, well, it com that comes from two things. One is something that Clive said to Doug, and that was constantly do less. Um, and the, because makeup, pinhead makeup for Doug was so extraordinary, he just didn't need to do anything. People were just reacting to that thing. Um, but as far as the chatterer is concerned, I literally couldn't do a great deal, you know, all the movement that you see me do in the film was all the movement I could do. And it then 
But I think the fallout of that was it just makes him incredibly powerful. In Hellbound, you see him with eyes because I whinged so much between Hellraiser and Hellbound about the fact that I couldn't see. Um, I thought we could do more with it, but I was wrong. We did film some bits where Chatter had got eyes and he's chasing Kirsty and Tiffany down in a, a corridor in the, in the hospital. Um, actually, it takes his power away. He then becomes like a Freddy. He then becomes, and this is not denigrating Freddy or any of the other, those other great movie monsters. Um, the fact that he's so still and he will still touch you. I mean, he will, Chatterer is the only one who actually touches Kirsty. Um, the others just took threaten. He never, and there is a good chance that the female Cenobite seems to be about to attack her with a, with a knife, but yeah, Chatter is right in there. He just does that, but he doesn't do anything apart from walk Chatter his teeth, and that's it. And it's incredibly effective. So frustrating, difficult, very, very, very challenging at the time. But I'm so grateful for the one, you know, uh, Clive's original design and. Um, uh, Nigel Booth, who actually created the Chatterer makeup, and Jane Wild Goose, who designed the costumes, and Rosemary Sylvester Fisher, who made the costumes, and everybody else on set, um, who actually brought this all together. Yeah, I think that's what what's so impactful, especially about the first Hellraiser, is it's not so much in your face; it's the visuals that that are put on screen mm. that make it so powerful and and haunting. Mm. Um, so you've been a patron of the London Horror Festival mm. since 2016. Seeing all of the the younger people get into horror and and the popularity in recent uh, years that horror has had, are you optimistic with the trajectory that the horror community is going? Um, you talked about everything coming from you know where we are in a society, and you could argue that as far as society goes, we're in a really strained situation from all mm, directions mm. Uh, maybe even unique in history so so do you feel like the trajectory of horror is going in the right direction or you're optimistic about where we're heading i'm very optimistic about young people um i'm optimistic about the fact that there is still such a love of the genre um it's interesting we are not in good times my parents were in the Second World War um, and in the Blitz and so on. And it's times are tough. And I think times are politically, well, funnily enough, I think we're very close to the 1930s. I think we're in the we're we're very much in a stage where something very nasty could eat. Well, in fact, it already has happened in Gaza and in Ukraine and, and so on. The, the, these things are happening now. Um We've never really known peace, I guess. So I am incredibly, I was at um, a film festival. I was screening my drama documentary, I Am Mon Monsters, uh, in Bournemouth last weekend. And met some really interesting young filmmakers and People, I was working with a young, uh, working with another young director called Charlie Steed um, last week as well. And there are people who are passionate about the genre. And what I really like is the fact that a lot of the young people I meet, A, are fans of Hellraiser, um, and that, you know, they, it's really interesting to talk to them, these young filmmakers. There's, when we talk about their influence, the influence of the film on that. But they've got their own visions. They've definitely got their own visions. And as I, as I was alluding to earlier, I think they definitely do reflect what's going on in the world. They, they reflect what's, even if it's not, and this is, you know, comes back to Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's not ostensibly about communism, but you can easily see how it could be taken like that because it's about friends not being who you think they are and, and actually being the enemy rather than the friend. And 
and masks and so on. So I think these are, I think there's two things. We can own artists, all artists, are the good artists, if they're listening to what's going on around them in the world. I think this is part of how art comes to be. Unless you happen to be writing in a cave and have no <laughs> no interaction with the world, you're going to be influenced by what's gone before and what's happening now. That's inevitable. So... As not just an actor in, but a writer of horror, uh, both in comics like Hel the Hellraiser and Nightbreed comics, and then your collection of short stories with what monsters do in other mm. people's darkness. Where do you yourself pull inspiration from? Really research. Um, just, I'm working on a novella at the moment, uh, and it's a murder mystery. So I am reading up a lot about forensic science. I'm reading up a lot about um the way our judicial system works in the UK I tend to base my my inspiration on reality as much as possible because I think that's kind of my style of writing when I write short stories I kind of only want to twist one thing I want to I want to make them as real as possible but just allow one twist uh, one of the earlier short stories, um, you have this character is effectively, a, you've heard of a storyteller. This lady is a story taker. And it's that kind of thing. So inspiration tends to come from research, um, which is a great way of getting rid of through writer's block. That was a very good piece of advice I read years ago when I was writing comics. If you just, just do some research just, and look at factual stuff. Um, I think we tend to be rather, in terms of actually writing short stories, I have to say when I first started writing short stories, the first thing I did was go back to Clive's Books of Blood. I thought, how do you write a short story? I know, I'll go and read Clive's Books of Blood. He's really good at writing <laughs> short stories. Um, the other influences are H.H. H. Munro, otherwise known as Saki, S-A-K-I, an Edwardian British writer who wrote these phenomenal three four page short stories some of which are very dark. the reason they were so short is because they were published in newspapers um and uh you know in the good old-fashioned days where you got news and you got literature at the same time um so yeah those are my main influences so so one last thing for me and then i'll pass it along but for you personally who would you put at the top of your list of horror creatures Oh, oh, okay. Really interesting question. Mm. Gosh, they're all springing to mind now. Can't say Chatterer. No, no, okay. <laughs> Says who? I, I, do you know? He's do iconic. You, <laughs> do you know what? I did that I got a QA a, a couple of weeks back and I got shouted at <laughs> for saying Chatterer. Is it? Which, to be honest, one is the closest to my heart, of course it is. Um, it's it's most likely to be the werewolf, and particularly Larry Talbot in The Wolfman, the universal black and white. Because, um, and I mentioned this in I Am Monsters, when I'm talking about monsters, it's the fact that the way Larry Tolbert becomes a werewolf is when he tries to rescue a woman who's being attacked by a werewolf, he gets bitten and it's just horrified about what's happening to him. I like that real thing. And I think the great thing about werewolves as well is about the family reaction and, and how do you, you've got this terrible secret and you're, you know, and you're compelled and there's a psychopathy about it and there's all sorts of things that you can read into into werewolves. So my creatures, you know, tend to be, yeah, probably up the top there is is the Wolfman. Well, in Lon Chaney Jr., that was the role he was born to play, right? He he was he had a tragic life and that, that role just resonated. It's it's really interesting. I've spoken to his son, Ron. Um, when I was doing the getting the um, 
uh, and we'll talk fully about this later on, possibly. But when I was sorting out permissions, um, I got. I ended up by chatting with Ron Chaney and I was supposed to be talking business. And at the same time, I was freaking like a fanboy and saying, your dad was Ron Chaney Jr. That's so extraordinary. And I'm talking, he's a lovely man. He's a really, really nice man. He was very generous and really supportive. Um, but it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ron Chaney Jr. is the Wolfman, but also uh, you, you said creatures. So I didn't choose... Um, Phantom of the Opera, because that's very much a man, mm -hmm. and that's something different in my book. Um, but that is the other thing, you know, Phantom of the Opera, is, and particularly Lon Chaney's uh, uh, rendition of it is a huge fan of that. So I'm going to go back to, I know you both were talking about, you and Jay were talking about the Hulu Hellraiser mm. remake. Um, I thought this when I watched it, and you can tell me your theory and also, I'm sure if you know something, you can't say anything, but sure. do you feel as if that's just a sequel and perhaps that's just another box, mm. another group of Cenobites, perhaps that Pinhead and your character, the Chatterer, maybe, because at the end of the movie, I remember when they're, he's he's talking up to like the, the god, I thought mm. to myself, oh, they're going to bring Pinhead in. And even after the film, I just thought, I bet this world coexists. I don't know what you think about that. I well, of course, this is a this is a very interesting idea, isn't it? I think there are many Cenobites. There are more Cenobites, but four. Um, mm. I find it very really interesting. We talk about the influence of the chatter. There has been a chattering something in all the movies, more or less. Or uh, mm -hmm. the you know, there's even a chattering dog. Um, but then Gary Tunnicliffe did a version of the Chatter in the later movies, and there's also Chatter as mm -hmm. well. So there are lots and lots of different Cenobites. Therefore, it you can have a female pinhead and you can have a male pen, pinhead. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know anything specific. There have been lots of conversations about Hellraiser TV series and and so on and and doing more of them, um, so yeah, I don't know. I I think it's a get because it's such a wide landscape of a, a, a world. It's such a big world that Cri uh, Clive created um in the first film and and was expanded by pete atkins and clive in the um in the second film you know because we get to go into hell and we get to see leviathan um uh, and so on so i think yes there's i think this house has many this there are many mansions in that realm i don't know what that quote is yeah that's i mean that's what i hope for is maybe there's connections and a lot more to come mm. um when you made hellraiser when you were in hellraiser one one thing i noticed about that film that really separates it from so many horror films is it's there's something that's so um dark and unnerving about that film i it's more than just the visuals it's the way the characters portray the script when you were acting in that film and i always wonder this with actors when they are on a set that's dark does that carry home with you and that you feel this darkness or, or is it kind of like your buds with these people and you're like, I can just cut it off, go home, eat dinner. It's, you know, you kind of forget about it. I wonder how that process is. It, it, honestly, I was really depressed at the end of Hellraiser. I think Simon was too. Being in a mask, it's like sensory deprivation. The mask that we in is very, if you put your hands over your ears, you get that rushing sound. And I was left in like that for eight hours. So I'm covered from head to foot in leather uh, or rubber. Mm -hmm. And I'm there for eight hours. So there was an emotional time. I remember when I got to the end of it, and I remember there was um, something that happened on the set of Hell as well just getting home crying and thinking oh my god um on the other hand it was hilarious i you think vincent price said it 
when he talked about acting and all these things, or please a bring some humor into into the film. Um, because, and I think the most successful how the most successful horror films have a level of humor in them, because um, that's kind of how they get you. Because if you're laughing at something, it's really much easier to scare you rather mm-hmm. than if it's you, you know you've got to. There are certain films which I think are just incre- intense, 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 intense. Um, I like I prefer my films with with with, uh, with more humor in them. On set and off set, and when we were in makeup, and it's hilarious. We had so much fun. I mean, which comes a lot from Clive um, and his sense of humor. Um, we were all, most of us were really young. The guys from Image Animation who created those makeups were either in the very late teens or early twenties. Um, and yeah, there, there was lots and lots of humor on set because when you're on set, you can't, take it seriously Mm -hmm. i think there's two things i think i probably suffered a lot more than other people just simply because and simon as well because of the physical thing that we were going through um in fact doug has said it at a at a convention he's just said you know whatever he went through in terms of sitting in a chain so pleased he didn't have to go through what simon and i had to go through um so yeah, it swings and roundabouts. There were some definite emotional costs, which mm-hmm. is why I really wanted to have eyes when I was playing at Chatterer in Hellbound when I came back to do it a second time. I really, really wanted eyes. Um, but lots and lots of laughter. That's cool. Um, you know, one thing I've always wondered, I'm a big fan of Hellraiser 2, and I've always just found that film fascinating, just the stories behind the scenes on it. Um, what were, you know, when you went into that script and you agreed to it, what was it like going into it? Because Clive doesn't direct it, but he's there. He's writing the script. What was um, that? No, Clive didn't write it. Pete Atkins wrote it. Oh, Clive see- produced. Clive produced. He was very heavily involved, mm-hmm. um, but he was preparing Nightbreed. Right at the time, so he didn't actually write it. Pete, Pete Atkins wrote it, but as I say, I, I know he was very heavily involved because it was Clive who decided that one of the Cenobites was going to be a child when they t- changed back. Um, and I think it was just uh, luck of a draw that I became a child. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was your question? Oh no, um, I was just curious what you. What did you think about the film as far as the process of making it and the outcome versus the first one? I know um, to me, it's the I, I always think of one and two is like the perfect combo. Right. I love them both. Mm. And I know they're different films, but um, I just wondered what your thoughts were on making two, how it came out, like your opinion of it. I've oh, always... yeah. I, yeah. I was very different because um, I'd not met Tony Randall before. Um, mm-hmm. And. It wasn't Clive, and I really missed Clive. Um, I think we all did, mm-hmm. because he was, you know, it, it was just so much fun on set. You get Clive's sense of humour on set. Um, this is no criticism of Tony, by the way. He's a great director. Um, and he's a really, really lovely man. And obviously, to be honest, as Cenobites, we didn't have that much interaction with him, because it's, I think one of the strengths of Hellraiser is the fact that it's a lot. It's a it's about adults, and you know your lead, apart from Kirsty, obviously, um, they make up the bulk of the movie. I think Doug always says, "I think the Cenobites are not on screen for more than more than eight minutes in the first film." I think perhaps slightly less until you get to Chenard and so on, and, and, and probably about the same in Hellbound. So the director's going to be concentrating on his leads rather than the Cenobites. Um, whereas with Clive, obviously, we were mates and hanging out and and, and so on and wanting to, to be as supportive. 
I mean, the great thing was it, it was the difference between shooting in a really small studio called the Production Village in North London um, and then shooting at Pinewood Studios. Uh, it was worlds apart in terms of the size of the production. Um, in terms of the finished outcome, I think it's great. Um, I, I'll tell you what, first, a, is it Pinewood where they shot a lot of the Star Wars films? Uh, yes, 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 and and James Bond and Batman. Um, mm. They just, you know, Tim Burton's Batman. Um, when they they just finished that when we did Nightbreed because we did Nightbreed uh, as as well. Um, I just lo I loved Hellbound. It's got some I love some of the lines. Um, uh, I loved I I got to meet Ken Cranham who's a wonderful, wonderful person. I uh, got to meet Claire again. I got to meet Kirsty again, um, hang out with all my mates. I got to meet Barbie for the first time and became very good friends with her, Barbie Wilde, who plays female Cenobite. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a lot of, again, it was just a completely different scale. Um, and it was fun. It was fun. I do like the movie. I, I think... There are people who prefer two to one, and one who people who prefer one to two. But they are kind of, they do bookend beautiful. I mean, they literally end starts about half an hour after the first film ends. So you know, it's it, it is a it's almost like a two part film, really. Yeah, I really think so. And one thing I wonder, um, and I'm going to pass this along. This is after this, but I, I wonder, you know, with filmmakers now. And looking back on someone like Clyde Barker, um, do you find that nowadays with filmmaking, especially with horror, that it's more difficult to achieve like a vision? Um, it seems like, and this is just my perspective, you know, classical filmmakers from the 70s, 80s, 60s, they can make a film and it can be so multifaceted, so multilayered. Uh, there could be so many things going on, like you were talking about behind the scenes or the meanings mm -hmm. behind it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really in your face. It seems mm. like now what filmmakers happen oftentimes with studios is it's almost it almost comes across like filmmakers are giving a thing. They're not giving a story. They're told, like, let's make a movie about this. But it seems like back in the day, it was more like I have a story, but I'm going to use this story to tell something about our society. Do you, I don't know mm. if you noticed that or maybe that's just maybe the nostalgia of loving Clive Barker and older sure. filmmakers. I I, it, I think it's difficult. I think that one of the reasons it's difficult for filmmakers is because Hellraiser is a is a fairly low budget movie. It was around about a million dollars at the time. Um, there is controversy as to whether or not Clive's always said it was under a million. I put, met people who said no, it wasn't. It was more than that. But it was around. It was not a big Hollywood budget movie. Um, New World Pictures were not, you know, New World Pictures, Roger Colman wasn't part of it, but it definitely comes out of a lot of the people who were there then who worked with Roger Colman. Um, and I always kind of feel it's a spiritual uh, um, child of, of Roger Corman's um, style of filmmaking. It's, <laughs> there is so much money involved in making a film these days, particularly a, a, a good one. It's why I like going to horror film festivals because then you tend to meet the young up and coming filmmakers who have got, who are doing what Clive was effectively doing and Roger Corman did with a lot of his early films. Um, they're low budget, you know, they're, they're, they are low budget films. You've got more flexibility because there's there's less to lose. Um, I think one of the reasons I love horror films as well is the audience. Horror audiences are some of the best in the world because they're so encouraging and forgiving. Um, they will, if they get the story. So I think you tend not to see in bigger budget films, it's there is an argument that could be said, and I'm sure somebody's going to come up with some wonderful examples that proves me prove me wrong. 
But I think it's easier for somebody to have a vision and to stick with their vision at the beginning when, it, when there's a lot less money involved. And this is what happened with Nightbreed. I mean, this is the classic case in point. Nightbreed was such a large vision. It was such a large budget. And the producers didn't really understand what they were. They didn't understand Clive's vision from what I can, from what I've been told. Um, and Clive's written about the fact that you completely, you know, it's it's hard. It's it's very hard. So I think if you find, as I say, going back to young filmmakers, I think there are some really exciting young film, filmmakers out there. And it's then hard to actually go on do stuff with you were talking about um book of monsters uh sorry how to kill monsters uh which was from stuart spark and and paul buckler at dark Rift. i also worked on their previous film um book of monsters um i i've watched those guys do this in terms of their production their style but it's they know what they do and they do it very well and that's horror comedy um, and they have a real vision for doing this kind of really good, entertaining horror stuff that's got both thrills um, and twist and turning and good acting and fun, but it's just fun. Um, and it's got it's got some wonderful, wonderful moments in it. Um, so I think the lower the budget, the easier it is to keep your vision. The bigger the budget. Until you become somebody like David Lean, where you can do something like Lawrence of Arabia and and keep your vision absolutely intact. Um, it does happen. Hitchcock did it. But again, I'm going back years and years and years for people to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I think that's true what you say about low budget horror as speaking from someone who's attempting to make uh, at at varying degrees, you know, I've written about five or six screenplays now, one with Jay actually recently from his idea. And we're in the process of, you know, going through the production notes and back and forth with producers, all that stuff. We'll probably make at least one at some point later this year, but it seems to be like in order to have that control where a studio can't kind of, undercut your vision and that kind of thing there right now at least in america it seems like like half a million is kind of that that perfect uh point where you have enough to have enough production value where you can still do some some pretty cool things on a budget now that everything's digital and you're not having to pay for film and and all the processes that went in with that that y'all had to do in the 80s and 90s but uh also not be too much of a financial risk to where you can't even get investors or you have to have so many cooks in the kitchen kind of thing. There, there, there does seem to be that magic. Yeah. And you think right what, what is very noticeable, if you look at the beginnings of films before the titles roll, it's the number of idents, producer idents you see at the beginning. I mean, in the, Good old days. Well, Hellraiser. It's New World Pictures. That's mm -hmm. the only ident you get. You get at the very beginning. Yeah. You make it a distributor as well. I can't remember if New World distributor. Now you got three or four production companies with producers yeah, and it's, on it's, each of them. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's really common to see half a dozen, if not eight, of these idents before you actually get anywhere. Um, well, that's two or three minutes of stuff because nobody can risk it nobody can put in all their eggs in one but you know unless they happen to have an awful lot of eggs um it, yeah it, it it's tough but well congratulations guys on finishing screen plays plays and um and, and keeping at it I, i'm immediately reminded of the of the adage you know a film is made when you write it when you film it and then when you edit edit it and there are three different films at those stages. Yeah. Um, and it took 22 years from my first idea wanting to write a screenplay and then, <laughs> and then writing about six books to keep from, or, or starting six books and never finishing any of the books to, to, to keep from actually fit writing a screenplay, just because I was terrified <laughs> of the format and final draft. And 
this was even before final draft was like the standard. Like I was in high school coming right. up with ideas and just trying to find a way not to write them. Uh, yeah. yeah. I had stuff on floppy disk. Oh God. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, yeah, I feel better about the 10 years it's taken me to write certain stories. And, <laughs> and, and so, yeah. I, and yeah, I've been going through, I'm in the process of, um, my shelves look beautifully beautiful behind me. Well, that's because I just cleared all the shelves behind me and started spreading all the things. Um, we can't go to bed tonight until I actually clear all the stuff off the bed because I just shelved everything out. I've got a bit of time at the moment, and I've suddenly got to this stage where, funnily enough, what happened to me was that I was, as I mentioned, I was in Bournemouth. Um, uh, last weekend for uh, a film festival and on I mean, arrived on the Friday I didn't know anybody else was there the people um, Stuart who co-producer of I Am Monsters and uh, uh, one of the co-writer and director of um, How to Kill Monsters wasn't able to make it down uh, and, and Lindsay who you mentioned uh, earlier on and so I, I was just in the hotel room by myself and I got an email saying, oh, um, this is for an uh, upcoming magazine called Phantasmagoria, which is doing a Hellraiser special. And I'd said, uh, and they asked me for original permission to reprint a short story uh, called Look See that came out when Hellbound came out. Um, and they got permission from Clive to to uh, do short stories based on the Hellbound Heart, Clive's original novella on which Hellraiser is based. But that's different from the Hellraiser films, and I was conscious of the short story that I was thinking about is very much based on the films. I do want to get into trouble. I thought, oh, I, I really need to rewrite this. Like, oh, I'm sitting in a hotel room all by myself, and there's nothing on TV. I can suppose I could sit down. Four hours later, over a th I think like one thousand two hundred words later, oh wow! Um, it's just like, oh, I can do this if I'm really. I've got no distractions. Um, and my study is nothing but distractions, so I'm working my way through the study at the moment, just clearing everything out. I've managed ninety percent of writing is is overcoming all of the obstacles to keep you from running <laughs> i remember pete atkins saying to me nick what you have to understand when you're writing it's amazing how important housework is going to become mm -hmm. i thought yeah and the other piece I, it was a lovely um i was at a um science fiction uh horror uh writers uh convention and there was a gentleman who used to write tv um series uh, I thought he was really fascinating. I can't remember the gentleman's name now, but he wrote things like The Avengers, um, not the Marvel the, thing. The British. The, TV, yeah. the British TV thing. Yeah, he wrote all those kind of things. He said, writing simple. Uh, it's um, bum to chair and pen to paper. And I thought, yeah, that is really all it is. Oh, I forget my case keyboard. And he said, no, no so I never bothered to do research. Just made it up. No one really cares. <laughs> if they want to know about nuclear fuels and so on, they'll go and watch a documentary. I'm writing fiction. It's just got to make sure you've just got to be consistent within the world. Um, I mean, I respect that point of view and what he was writing for. As I say, for me, I, it needs to be as real as humanly possible. I really like research and making stuff and putting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Everybody's process is different. Mm. But but before you know we we kind of wrap up. There's a couple questions I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about because sure. Nightbreed, particularly mm. the unread director's cut that, that come out a number of years ago, mm. is is one of my favorite Clive Barker films. And I just wanted you to tell us a little bit about your character and how you got involved in that film. You play sure. the character of Kinski. I played the character of Kinski. Um, God, I have been talking for a long time, haven't I? I hadn't realized how late it was. Um, again, Clive just offered me the role, um, went through various makeups. The first makeup he didn't like, and so I, I was going to be working with one uh, makeup. 
and then he decided it wasn't going to work. I'd not even tried it on. He just didn't like the way he realized it wasn't going to move. It's the in the book, the character who is with Pelican in the book Cabal, that says the character who's with Pelican when they meet Bloom is called Jackie. And Jackie has two faces because he's two brothers whose faces meld together. And they're very definitely two different characters in that one face. And it just wasn't working because they had to use a glass eye for one of the characters. So you couldn't get it to work. It just wouldn't. And so the next thing I knew, I was looking like Mac tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, that was that was it. There, there are longer stories, which I won't bore you with at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it is. And it was great. I, I got to see, you know, I was so happy and I got lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know? have a pretty significant character in the in the and story. Your eyes pretty... were exposed. You could see where you were going. I like... see where I was going. I had to dye my chest hair black. Um, I had to, <laughs> I got to run around in the in. The, I got to meet David Cronenberg. I got to you know, got to meet Anne Bobby. Became very good friends with Anne and Bobby um, and Craig Shepherd. Got lovely, lovely, lovely Craig Shepherd. Um, you know, I, I feel like your character almost feels like it and in, inspires in some way kind of Guillermo del Toro's version of, of Hellboy a little bit and, and kind of a little bit of the look of that character. Oh, that's interesting because, of course, Hellboy is actually not it, Guillermo's character. Yeah, it was a, it was a, comic, a comic before that. Yeah. yeah it was, it but, was, so it, I wonder if that might have even influenced... Somebody. Oh, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, there's something. I suppose there is something. A little. I have no idea. Possibly. Who knows these things? I, I, I would never claim as such, because I see I've never spoken to the author whose name entirely escapes me. Um. I think. Yeah, but that's all about inspiration. You know, when we were talking about what inspires you earlier, as well, well, everything inspires you. It, it, it can be sometimes a bit of a fragment of a line. It can be the way two words go together. It can be anything. So I'm, I'm not going to say. But Nightbreed, a wonderful film. And I, I it's touched a lot of people. I suppose if it's I'm It's kind of like a Clive Barker nightmare version of Alice in Wonderland a little bit. It is. I mean, Clive always described it as gone with the wind with monsters um, because of the scale of it. But I think what he's identifying is that at the heart, it's a love story. Um, it's, I, don't, I suppose in some ways it's about a woman who goes, who, who deals with a dead guy who's her lover. There is an analogy, you know, you can draw the comparisons between Hellraiser and, and, and Nightbreed at the core. Um, but it's also dealing with the monstrous. I mean, more in, emphatically, it's dealing with the monstrous and the fact that monsters are okay. Just leave them alone. Let them go away and be happy and do themselves, you know, stay away. And and also that human beings are assholes. Um, yeah, there's definitely some social commentary. More yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mentioned in I Am Monsters that the thing that always scared me in the Universal horror films was less the creatures because of me. To me, Frankenstein creature and um, Larry Tolbert are talking about our victims. Yeah, it's the mob that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. you know, that. that that's that's what's it's really the monsters and in, inside of us and, yeah, and how it can yeah. manifest as a group of people yeah yeah the and the, the way that fear makes monsters uh in in that sense so as my my final question for i turn to jay to, to wrap up is, is mm. tell us a little bit about your one-man show i am monsters and how that is now becoming a a documentary and how we'll be able to see that in in the coming months Okay, well, where we are at the moment is that okay, it came out of, um, you mentioned the London Horror Festival, um, which, as I say, it was a patron of, and I'd watched all these wonderful one-person shows, both male and female, and um, I just thought, this is a really interesting 
format and i know i've got enough and the, the format was always 50 minutes or just under an hour um i thought i know i've got enough stories not just from the the, the set but actually the backstory why does chatterer look the way he does uh for example and, and some of the stories that behind the scenes and i think but also what is it to be a monster so i i, I I thought I can work this up. I can work this up into something. Did it in 2019, thinking oh, I'm going to take this on the road. In fact, took it to Las Vegas, and, and Clive got to see it. Clive was very supportive in the creation of this. And then during lockdown, uh, somebody said to me they were doing a, a an online version of their festival, uh, Soho Horror Festival, became So Home Horror Festival. Uh, it was a good mate of mine, Mitch, uh, who who was doing Mitch Harrod, and he just said, "Nick, would you like to? Could you do just a couple of excerpts? It would be kind of cool if you did that because obviously people can't see Iron Monsters and really enjoyed it." So uh, I thought, then I looked at it and I thought, actually, this is kind of interesting, and then wrote up the script and looked at the script and expanded it so basically it grew from 50 minutes to 70 minutes um and then it was about okay it's not what we don't want to do is just do film a stage performance we need to do more than this and so there is animation in there and you get to see um there is and it starts with the stage performance and that's the way we begin it because it's very much based on the stage performance but then we start going to other places and, and so on um so it is me telling stories for 70 minutes but there are a lot of laughs there are quite a quite a lot of laughs in it as well um where can you see it um possibly we're in a, that kind of kilter moment uh, do i want to send it out to more film festivals or do we want to move straight to distribution um that is a really good question which i don't know the answer for um the best way to find out where you might get to see it is to go to nicholasevents.com uh click on the iron monsters link and then there is a um i got you can sign up for the newsletter um i've been really impressed by the fact that people i was at a convention a couple of weeks ago and i was getting I was telling people about it and they were really interested in signing up for it and i think there's definitely an audience for it and i'm every time i've sat and screened it i've screened it in london screened it in belgium uh to people where english is their second language and i've built you know, this in bournemouth and, and uh, birmingham i've screened screened it to students in fact um just trying to work out where i can screen it to different students uh, and I'm getting really, really good feedback and very, very interesting questions based on it as well. So it's fun. Yeah, it, it sounds like something that could I could very easily see finding a home like at Screenbox at some point. Mm, yeah, I, I they mean, do a lot I, of good horror themed documentaries. Yeah, I think I the, the very definitely what I want to do is physical media, uh, probably for about at least a year or so of physical media before we put it onto streaming sites. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just you'll, because... you'll make a lot more money off the physical well, yeah, on that I, side I, too. <laughs> yeah, and I've got to recoup quite a lot of money. It costs quite a lot to. It is eye water, and do not get me wrong. I think I've got clips, literally second, like clips that are eight seconds long, um, from the films, uh, and so on. And you have to pay for those. And I got really, really good deals because the, the rights holders were really good to me. But it's still a lot of money. Um, uh, and I'm very, very, very grateful to those folks. But um, yeah, it's it. I'm very, very pleased with the um, the outcome and the Blu-ray. It means I can do director's commentary, and I can. Um, I've, I've literally in my tidying up today, I've discovered the the release forms for a couple of short films. I just need to double check those so we can put those on as Blu-ray extras as well. So I think the Blu-ray package itself this should be with luck at least four of my short films. Hopefully the one with uh, the Peter Vincent guy and you playing Dracula. Um, that's not my film. 
Oh. Uh, that's not my film, I'm afraid. No, no, that's not my film. That's Dead Mouse. That was all part of the uh, Fright Night. Um, yeah, the Fright Night 2 it. documentary, which yeah, is on Screenbox. Yeah. Uh, oh, is it? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. No, they, they, those, those, those are not produced or owned, owned. I have directed three proper short films, and then I wrote um, and edited a, a, a like, a minute and a half film, which is really, really cool, um, uh, called Paper Cut. Um, so I've got, I think by the looks of it, we should be able to get those four onto the Blu-ray now. Um, I've just got to double check. I think there's a couple of um, releases I need to chase up for those, but hopefully those should be involved in, included as well. As Paper Cut sounds terrifying. Paper cuts <laughs> <are terrifying. laughs> uh, oh, all right well we'll wrap things up um be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel or to wherever you're listening to this podcast um follow us on instagram we have a facebook group uh we have an amazon music playlist we have a tiktok for some reason so follow us on all those things and see what we're doing uh, mr vance nicholas thank you so much for taking some time with us this is uh, this has probably been one of my favorite interviews uh, just because Hellraiser yeah. and Nightbreed have such a special place in our hearts. Um, you, you've already told us about your documentary. Um, mm -hmm. I do request ship to the U.S. and offer autographed copies. Yes, all those things are very definitely nice because I, I, yeah. I'm i one of yeah, those no, people, I, get that. I love physical media. I absolutely yeah. adore it. I, I would show you my area, but it's nasty. But there's a lot of physical media here. So big fan <laughs> of that. We will definitely purchase our copies. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Cool. Um, so that's going to be it for this episode. I'm Jay with John, Kellen, Nicholas, Vince, and TJ. And until next time. Keep it spooky.